That same melody as the hymn. Worship at St. James this evening. Um, just before we begin, I should say the, the COVID situation in Suffolk County is evolving and fluid. I, those are the exact words from my county official I was talking to. Evolving and fluid. Um, so um, this evening, um, we have the windows open. Um, and it being a milder than usual July night, that's not so bad. Still, um, people go, oh, we should, we'd be cooler in the AC if we didn't have them open. Yep, but yeah. more air is better than less air. Uh, and I'll be wearing my mask during communion, etc. We may make other decisions in the week. It, the situation is evolving and fluid. Don't know how it'll be next week. We will definitely have worship service. But um, if you are not vaccinated, of course, you know, it's highly recommended you wear a mask. Um, beyond, but we're not going to police that. But beyond that, um, those are, that's what we're going with tonight. So... Um, God bless us. It's great, under any circumstances, to be together. Um, friends in Christ, the family of God, are gathering with uh, Jesus, uh, our Savior, and the lover of our souls. We begin now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God tells us clearly in his word, whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Then let us kneel and confess those sins. God of grace, love, and communion, we confess that we have failed to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We ignore your commandments, stray from your ways, and follow other gods whom we have believed will give us happiness. Have mercy on us, forgive our sin, and raise us to new life, to a wise and good and true life, full of your grace, that we may serve you faithfully and give honor to your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. And Christ is risen. To those who love him, he comes to live in, with, and through them, giving a new life, dead to sin and alive to God. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, Bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's please rise to sing his praise.
and standing to hear our Lord speak to us in the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do, that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. <laughs> Join me now and follow along with the prayer of the day as found in your bulletin. Heavenly Father, as you graciously provided bread for the Israelites in the wilderness, manna, manna sent, sent from, from heaven, heaven, so you have graciously sent your own dear Son, the true, true bread, bread heaven, heaven sent. sent. Only he gives ultimate nourishment to your people. Only, Only he, he gives, gives life, life to the world. world. Grant us faith to feast on him. The, the true, true bread, bread heaven, heaven sent. sent. Then Jesus will live in us. Then, then we, we will, will live, live in, him. in him. Through the same Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. He lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our hymn. The Old Testament reading, 1 Samuel, chapter 18. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David 
because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine. And the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy and said to him, Go and carry them to the city. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Join me now as we pray for Pastor. Lord God, for your gracious forgiveness through your son Jesus, we give you thanks. We ask for your blessing now on Pastor Neil. Let the words that he speaks come through him from the, the good news to being brought to us today. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you. <clears throat> Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit, amen. We're looking at the life of David, which is the longest, and I'm fond of telling you this, it's the longest narrative presentation of a single human life in all of ancient literature. Are there lots of other great epics and sweeping accounts in ancient literature? Yes, there are. For example, the Iliad. But the biblical account of David focuses on one person to try and show us what makes or breaks a life. So tonight, We've got something else that if we have it, makes our lives. And if we don't have it, breaks our lives. Friendship. Tonight, we're looking at what God is showing us about friendship in the life of David. Where are we in the story? <clears throat> well, after the great victory over Goliath, Saul brought David away from Jesse's house. Jesse was David's father. He brought David out of Jesse's house to his own court. From chapters 18 to 20 in 1 Samuel, however, Saul becomes murderously envious of David, of his success, of his popularity. He tries to kill David six times. We talked about that last week. This is the most dangerous time in David's life. He's living right in the court of King Saul, who has become his enemy. Every so often, Saul just goes off in a rage, has one of these fits, and tries to kill David. David is desperately trying to ride out the storm. He didn't want to become a permanent enemy of Saul. He was hoping that the king's fits and rages would go away or pass over or, or be healed or something like that. Now, Saul had a son, Jonathan, Prince Jonathan. In this most awful, dangerous time in David's life, chapters 18, 19, and 20, at the start of this terrible episode, we see beginning the friendship of David and Jonathan. At the end of chapter 20, at the end of this terrible period, we again have the friendship of David and Jonathan. What, what's the biblical author telling us? That during this most dangerous evil chapter in David's life, friendship, this deep friendship with Jonathan, bracketed the evil. Friendship with Jonathan is the bracket at the beginning and at the end. Scholars think this is not, you know, by chance. Scholars think we're meant to be shown here that friendship with Jonathan literally contained the evil. Evil didn't just overwhelm and drown David. Friendship made it containable, bearable, made it survivable. Otherwise, David would never have made it. 
So have you had six attempts made on your life? Likely not. Nevertheless, you've had troubles and you're going to have tragedies. You're going to have storms in your life and you will sink without friends. You'll never make it through life without them. Close friends. Friendship has a vital, sustaining role to play in everyone's life and there's no replacement for it. Somebody says, well, what about marriage? Yeah, listen, I can tell you as a married person, it's the friendship in your marriage that gets you through the hard times, not the romantic aspects or the erotic aspects, good as they might be. Without real friendship, you'll never make it through life in the way you're hoping to. That is how important it is. God actually made us to need others. We were designed by God to need Friends, deep, loving, human relationships. You say that, what? That makes it sound like there was a flaw in God's design model. I mean, why should a person need other people like that? It's not a flaw. It's because God, it's because human beings were made in the image of God. In the very first chapter of Genesis, God says, let us make man in our image. Let us. Who's God talking to when he says, let us, let us make man in our image? That verse is a reminder that the God of the Bible is a triune God, meaning that Christianity, unlike any other religion, there's, there's no other religion that believes in a trinity, says friendship is at the very essence and center of God. That is a deep love and friendship between God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the persons of the trinity. So these Relationships at the heart of God means friendship is at the very heart of the universe, the maker of the universe. Before there was a universe, before there was anything, from all eternity, there was an eternal friendship of divine persons who infinitely and perfectly had love toward and knowledge of and joy in one another. The reason then why human beings have to have other human relationships is because we're made in the image of this God, to be like God. God has friendship at his very heart. That's why it's in you, in your design. You'll never be able to live life without close friends. And by the way, a bit of an aside for a moment, God's church is intended by him to be a place where we learn friendship, show friendship, and by practicing, grow in friendship. If a church was not a friendly place, shame on that church, it's failing. It's gotta be a friendly place. Um, which is why it's urgent that if we possibly can, in spite of what may be coming next with COVID, somehow we get back to church in person, in some way. Friendship is so important to emotional health, to spiritual health, and the church's role in fostering it is so important. There, there is an urgency to this. Yeah, there's an urgency about the COVID thing. There's an urgency to this too, okay? God wants his people to be growing as a church of friends, not strangers, which also means when we're here, we should not just, I mean, on any given day, something might be up, but as, as, usually we should not just take communion and split. We need to slow down, say hello after worship. We need to hang out a little. We need to be friendly, show some care. Meet somebody new. For Christians, this is not just a pleasant little add-on. Don't have to have it, no. It's God's plan, friendship. It's the communion of saints. All right, then let's learn what friendship really is. You know, David and Jonathan, these friends, <laughs> They didn't merely, you know, friend each other on Facebook. That was, it was more than that. They, they show us what the Bible means by friendship. They show us what it's made of. It's something that we modern people actually, we need to be shown this. It, it's actually startling how much deeper their thing was than what we usually settle for. In verse 3, it says, Then Jonathan made a covenant with David. Now, that would have been a covenant of friendship. Later, at the end, in 20 verse 42, he talks about 
oaths of friendship. They swore loyalty to each other, which again is covenant language. Now, a covenant friendship? What are we talking about? When do we ever use this word covenant? Let me explain this by comparison and contrast. In the business realm, there's what you call a consumer vendor relationship. If you are a consumer or user, you have a relationship with the vendor as long as that vendor meets your needs at an acceptable cost to you. If you find a different vendor who gives you better service or the same vendor for a, a better cost, as part of the same service for a better cost, you're under no obligation to stay with the first vendor. You go to the second vendor. That's the business relationship. That's the model of the marketplace. A covenantal relationship is very different. Now, obviously, a, a user-vendor relationship has no constancy to it. No constancy. It's always changing, varying with the circumstances. Your needs change. The costs change. There are changes in the circumstances. No constancy. A covenant relationship, however, is different because a covenant relationship is not a means to the end of fulfilling your individual needs. Rather, the covenant relationship is an end in itself. The relationship itself is the goal. Okay? A covenant relationship is steady and constant in spite of the circumstances, whether your needs are being met or not. So then let's, let's compare these two things. If you're a, a user, your own individual needs and rights take precedent. If you're not getting your needs met, you change to another vendor. In a covenantal relationship, though, the thing that comes first is responsibility. Rights come after that. In a covenantal relationship, your individual need is put below your responsibility for the relationship and the thriving of the other person. Your needs come second. The relationship to the other person comes first. Now, previous to the last 60 years, all right, we, we've always had vendor, user-vendor relationships. Sure, we've always had businesses. And in most cultures, cultures your user relationship, which is very changeable, because you're out as soon as your needs aren't being met. But anyway, all that was confined to the literal business world. All other relationships, family relationships, neighbor relationships, friend relationships, all those were covenantal, where you didn't just get out if your needs weren't being met. Because there was a commitment to the relationship. There was a commitment. Your needs were not as important as the thriving of the other person. But all commentators, sociologists, reporters, I mean everybody, liberal or conservative, agree something remarkable has happened in the last 60 years or so in Western culture. The model of the marketplace, the model of the user relationship has spread out and actually become the basis for conducting all relationships. So the family relationships, the civic relationships, religious relationships, and friendship relationships are all done now on a market basis. They're all done on a cost benefit analysis. If I'm getting my needs met, I'm happy to stay in the relationship. If I'm not, I'm out of here. But users aren't friends. And almost all of us are being changed into the image of our culture. Our church involvement and our marriages and our family relationships and our civic relationships, our friendships are more and more turning into, have become, user relationships instead of covenantal relationships. And that is super unhealthy because when it comes right down to it, we still need friends. Because of our design, we need constancy. We need commitment. We need friends. Everything now runs on a user model. Users are not friends. Users don't build friendships. What do they do? They network. 
Now, I'm not saying network is wrong. networking is wrong. It's got a place in business. We just need to see that there's a big difference between networking and building a friendship. Networking is about categorizing people with the goal of efficiently getting them to cooperate with you and make the response that you're looking for. It's how a user manages their relationships. But a friend, a friend wants to find out your strengths and your gifts and then just celebrates and affirms them. That's who you are and I'm glad to know you. Doesn't use them. A friend also wants to find out your weaknesses and your flaws. And when they do, they gently correct you because your friend wants you to thrive. A friend is not a user. Look at Jonathan. The minute he makes this covenant, the minute he commits himself in friendship to David, his individual needs immediately go into deficit. Like immediately. He loses his rights to the kingship. That's pretty huge. Also because he's a friend of David, he loses the trust of his father. He gets hostility from his father. There was a downside, big one for Jonathan. Big cost to himself. But he pays it because he was a friend. He didn't say, my individual needs are not being met here. I'm going to switch vendors. No, he was a friend. And I'd like to bring in something else, something different now. One more thing that characterizes friends, which is transparency. Meaning, well, 1 Samuel 18 verse 1 says that David and Jonathan were one in spirit and that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. Now, to be one in spirit means that friends, friends are transparent with each other. That is, they open to let you see in. Users don't do that. Users spin how they're coming across. They put up a front, a veneer. They have to control what you see because they're only in the relationship to get a desired response from you. But friends open to let you see in. See what? See their feelings, their real feelings. See their regular, ordinary life. See their decisions and their flaws and their weaknesses. Friends are transparent with each other. So let me get very practical here. Here is how you get a friend. I'll tell you what you don't do. You don't go looking directly for a friend. You don't put out a little ad, wanted, a friend. No. Instead, you look for a person who shares a common interest or passion. You like fishing? Find somebody else who does too. Or whatever your interest is. When you find this person, don't network them. Rather, you pour on lots of constancy, and you pour on lots of transparency, and it happens. But in our culture, that's difficult to do, because you and I are not trained for it. Leading to my final point. Where do you get the power to pour constancy and transparency onto another person, to be that way with them? Where do you get the power to be a friend like that? Of course, we can all sit around saying, hey, I want a friend like this. But come on, let's ask ourselves the question, how can I be a friend like this? You know, a friend like Jonathan, a life-transforming friend. How can I be that guy or that like gal? You may be thinking, me, a friend like Jonathan? You know, he's totally awesome, agreed. But honestly, I'm doubtful about my ability to emulate him. Nothing in my culture has trained my mind, emotions, or will to operate like him. Frankly, I doubt I could be a friend like Jonathan. Okay. It's actually much better to begin with an honest estimation of where you're starting from. However, the fact is, though your culture indeed has not helped you, you do have something Jonathan did not have. Jesus. You are baptized into Jesus. You have Jesus' living word. You have Jesus' fellowship in his supper. You have his church, which is his family, a family of people who are all growing or trying to grow in him. You have Jesus. Jonathan didn't. And Jesus Christ 
says in John chapter 15, says this to his disciples, his friends. He says, I, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, Jesus says. For everything I learned from my father, I've made known to you. And greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You have Jesus. And he's come into this world and into your life as the ultimate friend and friend to you. Despite the ways of the world, you'll not only be saved, but you'll be changed and released into life-giving friendships if you trust and and embrace him, the greatest friend and lover of your soul. What did we say were the qualities of a true friend? Transparency and constancy. Yeah, friends open and they let you in. And friends never let you down. That's transparency and that's constancy. Now look at Jesus. How open has Jesus been with you? Well, has he let you in to see his feelings? Or does he play, you know, sort of the aloof super CEO type with us? Now he lets us in. In the four Gospels, Jesus shows us his sorrows, his tears, his joys. He also lets in on on his decisions. He lets us in on how he thinks in depth, in everything. Not God wrapped in a mysterious cloud, but God become human, visible, transparent. How open was Jesus to you? His arms weren't just stretched open. They were nailed open to you. That's how open he is for you. And constancy. Look at Jesus on the night before his death, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. I never tire to point out that that's what that window is. Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his death. Now how constant were his disciples and friends with him sleeping when he told them, I need you to stay awake with me. And then his friends running away on him, fleeing. They were denying him. They were betraying him. And Jesus, all alone, knows he's got a choice before him. I'm either going to get hell tomorrow on that cross or I'm going to evade suffering and death but lose my friends. What choice did Jesus make? I'll take hell, he said. That's constancy. And if you see that his transparency and this constancy was for you, that will turn you into the same kind of friend. Every bit as good a friend as Jonathan. The key to being transformed like that is seeing and connecting with Jesus, your greatest, best friend. Do you know that his relationship with you is not user-vendor? And that's what we fear. That's what we fear. That we will sin so much, go against his will and desire so much, fall into that same sin again for the umpteenth time, so many times that we think Jesus will do a cost-benefit analysis on us and say, that is it. I'm done with this guy or this gal. But that's not his relationship with you. It's covenantal. He made a covenant with you. When? At your baptism. He made a covenant with you. And he's committed to his relationship with you no matter what the cost is to him. He's committed to the relationship with you. Committed to forgiving you always no matter how often he has to do it. He's committed to restoring you and renewing you. Committed to you no matter the cost to him. You are more important to him, the relationship is, than his own comfort or needs. And he baptized you into this covenant friendship with himself. He will never let you down. Has he ever unbaptized you? Of course not. Rather, in the Lord's Supper, he renews his covenant of love with you. He renews it and he reminds you of it. This is my body. This is my blood broken and shed for you. 
It's not user vendor. I have totally dealt with all your sins and shortcomings. It's the friendship with you that I'm totally committed to, says Jesus. Receive me and my work for you. Receive it yet again, and let's go on together, living in communion as close friends. The more that soaks into you, the more he soaks into you, the more it will transform your other relationships as well. You will be the constant, covenantal friend, the transparent friend, the Jonathan. And what you become, because of your relationship with Jesus, will rub off on others to be influenced, to be more like that themselves with you. Friendship will grow. O oh Lord God, thy kingdom come. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen. Would you please rise? At our baptism, the apostles, that God made that covenant with us, covenant of friendship and baptism, the apostles' creed was recited. Let's recite it again. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers, I was just asked before the service to pray for George Seltzer. All right. That's Ken's father. father having surgery this week. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll chime out, but... Chime out. I'll chime out. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. To God... Our good and gracious master, let us offer our prayers for ourselves, for the church, for the world at large, and for all people in need. Merciful God, lead us to acknowledge your mercy with gratitude that in turn we may be quick to show mercy to others. Preserve us from pride. Lead us instead to cling to Christ and his forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Bless Grace Lutheran Church in Jamaica, Queens, and all congregations to love and support one another. Bless their outreach to those suffering from sickness, floods, or famine in other parts of the world, particularly in the Caribbean. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Deliver us from evil, O Lord, that we might live in your truth. Bless Aurora Kelly Corrigan, who will be baptized here next Friday evening. Lead us all to return daily to our baptism and in faith receive Christ's body and blood in your holy supper. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Uphold our nation and give us good government let those in authority act with honesty. Lead them in love, righteousness, and devotion to the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Hear our prayers for those we love. Pastor Henry Schriever, scheduled for a hip replacement this Wednesday. Dennis LaRock, now recovering at home following spinal surgery. Liz Wagner's godson, Don Gaw, undergoing tests to prepare for sinus surgery. Ed Fox's dear friends, Ken and Donna Seppi, as Donna continues to battle cancer. Linda Raya's friend, Victoria Staskiel,
facing complications during recovery from stressful open heart surgery. And those mourning the death of Karen Bernard, also a friend of Linda's, tragically killed in a skydiving accident. And all those we name now before you, allowed in voice or in prayerful silence. For George Seltzer, Ken's dad having a surgery on a tumor this coming week. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The offering plates are in the narthex that they, they have not passed them back and forth for more than a year. Uh, we also give um, electronically, and uh, many people do that, and it's, it's great. Uh, what we will do all together right now is pray, the offering prayer. Please join me. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is a meal of friendship. <laughs> Peace with God, friendship with God. We, we, would, we think that about any time we're invited to a friend's house for dinner. That's why it's so important to open up our homes to others. It's really something. When somebody comes into your house, they're really opening themselves to you, and Jesus is really open to you. Come to his house, his table, and he's giving us what a meal, his body and his blood is for you. Let's... Um, Embrace, believe in and embrace all that he's giving us, all the friendship and love, forgiveness and everything else in this holy meal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who, having created all things, took on human flesh as a descendant of David and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake, he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest. Sing Hosanna to the Lord. To the Lord. Comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. 
This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Welcome to the table of the Lord. Please kneel. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Savior, Jesus, given in love for you. Take and eat. The very body of Christ, our Savior, given for you. Welcome to the table of the Lord. Please kneel.
Take and eat. This is the very body of Christ given for you. rise and we'll join together singing the nun to miss. benediction of the Lord who loves you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for some announcements. See the bulletin for the latest information about the Smithtown Emergency Food Pantry as well as a list of the items we've been asked to donate at this time. And next Sunday is the deadline for completing Outreach Ministry School Kits for Lutheran World Relief. Please see the bulletin for complete information and finish your shopping turn in your donate, it, bring, turn in your donations this week. Our next We Share Bereavement Support Program begins on Wednesday, September 8th. Complete information and registration details are in the bulletin and Greek Share brochures are available in the Norfix. Jerry Montai will be sewing pillowcase dresses for Orphan Grain Train. Please consider donating slightly used pillowcases and sewing notions and placing them in the blue bin in the Norfix. See the bulletin for complete details and direct questions to Jerry or Liz Wagner. So, so I've got lots of questions, but I should ask Jerry. Yeah, maybe they They're going to make dresses out of pillowcases? Yeah. That's the what, is this, what is this sewing notion? I guess thread, needles, that kind of stuff. Rip rack, you know. So not, so not sewing stuff, sewing notions. Notions. Okay, got it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've got some grain. Lou, we've got grain sacks. So what do we have at home? Those, fat, those sacks that you want to get rid of. Yeah, perfect. Uh, okay. Okay, good to know, good to know. Good those are all our announcements? That's it. Well, Vacation Bible School starts oh, uh, uh, coming uh, up. I think, I think all kinds of supplies have come in, yep. so thank you for that. Um, uh, so that starts on, on Monday, a week of, of teaching. Um, I think we have about, now our numbers are down, but down to 70 still sounds good, right? But um, mm -hmm. I think other years, none, like last year we had nothing. The year before, I think we had 120. So it's, it's, and we'll see how many people come, you know, because it was like, oh, well, COVID, it's behind us now. And now it's like, oh, is it? So we'll see who comes on Monday. But um, it's an opportunity to have fun and especially to teach these kids about the love of Jesus. That starts for, for a week on Monday, uh, weekday morning, starting Monday. 
Let's please rise and sing our final hymn. Chosen desire. 